Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN. for an annual Mandela Day in our honor. Our struggle for freedom and justice was a collective effort. Mandela Day is no different. It is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Mandela Day will not be a holiday, but a day devoted to service. It is our hope that people will dedicate their time and effort to improve the conditions within their own community. We thank you for participating in Mandela Day. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. One of the most profound quotes from the late great Nelson Mandela. So what did you do today to make a difference in someone else's life for Mandela Day? Since 2010, the Nelson Mandela Foundation has called on citizens the world over to adopt the late stalwart's nature of being a public servant and strive to make the world a better place. This year is even more special as it is a hundred years since Madiba's birth, thus giving rise to the Nelson Mandela centenary celebrations. To talk more about this auspicious occasion, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Ndadesi Lohatang. On a day of such massive celebration. It's a biggie and yes. we are really honored uh, with the role that people have played uh, mm -hmm. to help uh, build this legacy and respond to the call that Madiba made back in 2008. Yes. When he said, uh, the world remains beset by so much human suffering, poverty, inequality, that it's in our hands to help build a different world. And to keep imagining that question, that, uh, that question that he said should bother all of us every day. Every day. What am I doing to yeah. help build a country of my dreams? And mm. I think people are showing how much of dreamers they are, uh, but they are not just dreamers, but they are going out there to make sure that they build that dream. And it is exactly this spirit of service that Madiba was calling on all of us to embody and to act out every single day. Precisely, and, and initially, and I'm glad that this message is now stepping in a little bit. Initially, we had asked for people to do 67 minutes. You'll remember the 67 yes. minutes campaign. Yes. Then we changed it uh, after a while, saying, look, uh, this 67 minutes doesn't actually work. You don't get to have impact in people's lives when you, you're just giving 67 minutes. After all, Madiba gave 67 years of yeah. his life uh, saving humanity. So the least we can do is to try do it every day. Um, that's why we changed it to take action, inspire change in our community, and make every day a Mandela Day. So the spirit of giving, why is it so important, the spirit of service? Why is it so important in our society? I think the, if, if Madiba is anything, he was a servant leader. Uh, of, uh, the, I don't think he's, he's second to none yeah. in terms of uh, servant leadership. And, and if we are to do anything to honor him, how much better than to respond in it like servant too? Uh, today we're finding ourselves in a, a position where uh, most people find it difficult to just serve for a day, to serve in a particular, even in, in your own sector. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And he, he was uh, in one of the hospitals uh, that uh, uh, yeah, yeah, named after uh, 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 um, Sisulu. And he, he then said, you know, it, in whatever station you, you have, wherever you are stationed, yeah. try to just give it your best. Mediocrity shouldn't be the language that's spoken. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because we, 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 we lingered, we gave in to mediocrity, 
that we find ourselves where we are today. Yes. That we, 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 we want to be served more than serving. And uh, never that before has this message been more important. Precisely. But you've themed this year, there's a hashtag that accompanies it, hashtag action against poverty. And we know the reality, the growing inequality in our country and the absolute depravity and poverty that many of our uh, countrymen still live under. So why this particular theme? Why the spotlight for you? You know, the, the, we, we're responding again to the 2008 call because Madiba identified poverty as a big issue mm -hmm. back then already. And uh, today, uh, to, to be getting the statistics that Statistician General released recently, uh, in which he said that 25% of South Africans go to bed hungry. Mm. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, when Sis Bongi comes on, she will also touch on these st figures about 25% of our children uh, suffering for, from severe malnutrition, mm. uh, leading to stunting. Um, you know you can't relax. Consequences of stunting. You can't relax. Yeah. You know, in, a, in a country where young people are heavily hit by unemployment, uh, we shouldn't be um, uh, relaxing. And at the moment, you find that uh, even in the case of people like myself, mm. like uh, many others, uh, it remains, your success remains a draw of the lottery. Which card, which ticket did you draw? Yeah. It's not, the society did, does not create a, a, sp a, a space for you, a platform for you to just be great. Um, and it's that that we're trying to change uh, with the work that we're trying to do to say poverty should be our next focus because if we don't, uh, we will then be reaping the fruits in the next hundred years. And, and we're asking South Africans and the global community that may we not reminisce about Madiba's past hundred years. We should be reminiscing about those past hundred years mm -hmm. with a future in mind. Absolutely. You know when you talk about uh, success in this country or even just access being based on a draw of, a, of the lottery. You've been serving in this role for five years now, but your own story, your own life story, before you got to this position, exemplifies the same idea of a draw of a lottery. Yeah, precisely, and, and you know, I always say that you have a script that's written, and it's how you defy that script yeah. uh, that should, should, should be uh, something that we shouldn't have uh, children, young people particularly having to have to defy the story. Mm. We must just create the platform. Mm. Um, with a, a child of a single parent who had to mother six children, you know, uh, losing four in the process. Yes. Uh, and, and, and all that, it's not a unique story. Uh, there are many who go through the same, mm. but it's to make sure that even if they have the same uh, script, that society creates a platform for them to be better yes. at doing uh, it. There's a story you tell about that phone call you got, you know, and having to relate that message to your, to your mother about this opportunity to go and study. Yeah, you know, I, I, when I got that call and I, I was saying to her, I, I just want to go to university. I remember my granny was blind. Mm. Uh, she was lying on the floor uh, and, uh, and my mom says, uh, said to me, with what money? Yeah. We thought, man, no child of mine can go to university. I mean, really, come, come on. And, uh, and my granny t t looked up and said, in Setswana, fa le 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 hodi, le mm. In other words, uh, if, if, if he's crying out for that uh, hot, hot coal, give it to him so that it burns his hand, mm. but we'll support you. Mm. And then I, I went on to uh, be funded by by the community, it, a greater community, and, 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 uh, and no person, th my story exemplifies that, that no person makes themselves. Mm. We are all made by a community, and it's how we then r give it back uh, to ensure that the uh, community changes. That's why even for the lecture that was given by President Obama, yes. um, it's looking at that, how much of us can be citizens, uh, active citizens, that so all of us must be. Why was he chosen? Why did the foundation choose to bestow this honor on him, former president of the U.S., now, uh, uh, Barack Obama? <laughs> you know, the, when we, we, we worked on it, uh, this was three years in the making. Wow. Um, so uh, what, you, what you saw yesterday was not just something that uh, was just uh, put on and the lights uh, went on. It was uh, a bit of hard work that was put into it for him to be here. Yeah. But it, it's not hard work of convincing, but rather of making sure that we get the right person. Um, Madiba 
it's, 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 it's really true to say that he admired uh, President Obama's uh, achievements mm -hmm. uh, because if he can, uh, it was demonstration that if he can, all of us can. Yes. Um, but besides that, it's the kind of uh, uh, politics that he had of inclusivity, of trying to build a, a, a united world mm -hmm. like Madiba tried. And we're hoping that this message of active uh, citizenry is something that will carry forward. Absolutely. And we say halala, and we pledge to do our part, to play our part and continue to serve as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, a big thank you to the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Silo Hatang. Coming up next, it was by her ill granddad's side when she discussed with Madiba continuing his legacy. After the break, Nelson Mandela's first granddaughter, Ndileka Mandela, joins us to tell us exactly how she's taken on this commendable task. Be back after this. Can you imagine being born to a grandfather who spent the first part of his life as an enemy of the state, then having the course of history declare him one of the most impactful global icons of our time? My next guest considers herself truly blessed to have been born a Mandela, and she joins us now to talk about what the centenary celebration means to her. Please welcome Madiba's first granddaughter, Ndilega Mandela. It's wonderful to have you here. How are you feeling with the centenary celebration? Well, I'm quite excited, yes. you know, and um, also humbled as, as, as Madiba's granddaughter that still now, you know, five years on after his passing, mm. he's still being revered and people are still talking about him and continuing his legacy. So it is it's quite humbling. It's a quite humbling experience. But throughout his life and even in death, in fact, you've had to share him. Mm -hmm. You've had to share him with the world, with the country. Surely that has also been filled with its own fair share of ups and downs. It was not easy, I have to say. And there are times that, you know, I would be so annoyed with him and angry with him and that I wouldn't talk to him because sure. the illusions that I had that when he came out of prison, he would be my grandfather, I would be able to go have coffee with him and, and have him to myself, you know, did not happen. Yeah. To an extent that I missed the prison days where we would spend one-on-one -on -one and there would not be other people at the table because after he was released, even if he was at home, there were always people around and he became not just my grandfather, but everybody else's grandfather. Yeah. You talk about how you are blessed to carry this name, but it also means that there's quite a weight on your shoulders, a <laughs> weight of expectation to yeah. a large degree. Yeah, yeah. The weight starts within the family. You know, when you grow up in iconic families, to find your voice, yeah. the unique you is very difficult because in this milieu of this big family and a big name like Granddad, mm. to find yourself and find your voice is extremely difficult. So you have got to master that and then go outside of the family and be able to be your own person. And it, that also is quite difficult because people tend to always measure you against him and and yet you are your own person mm. you know you were sh i was shaped and formed when my diva was in prison by my grandmother and by the time that he was released i was a fully fledged adult yes. with my own identity so my identity will be completely different from that of his yeah and then uh, i can imagine with families like that i think there's probably um, much to be said about that those yeah. dynamics mm -hmm. carving out your own space but still yeah. staying so close yeah. to this incredible surname that you carry it this is. clan yeah. that you belong to but let's go back to when you were young mm -hmm. do you remember your first your first fondest memories of your grandfather it would be when i turned 16 because mm -hmm. he started writing to me when i was 10 years old and of course yeah. typical me being me asking him for stuff because that's what grandchildren do to their grandparents. You know, you ask them for stuff. What are you asking from a I was asking for yeah, well, well, for me, the concept of prison did not even ring a bell. For I me, see. it was years, yeah. So I asked him for a coat with fur on the neck because mm. that's what I had seen in an old Yeah, clearly. yeah. So that's what I asked for. But I first saw him when I was 10, 16 because the prison laws in those days, you would go to Robben Island on 10, 16. 
So I first saw him when I was 10, 16. Do you remember that visit? How difficult was it? It was very difficult. First, it was my first time on a ferry. Mm -hmm. I'd never been on a boat before. Mm -hmm. And my aunt, having been there before, he asked, she told me that I must sit below deck, of course. I must not be below deck because I'd be nauseous, but it was raining, so I ended up below deck. Yeah. Go to Robben Island and you are made to wait. Whenever you went to see political prisoners, you, you go the, the, la the last one to visit. Mm -hmm. You go along this long corridor, you pass all the windows. Of course, you always find him sitting because they did not want you to see how tall he was. Wow. You sit and you greet him and embrace a glass window, a you know, small glass window. You kiss and touch through the glass panel. And, mm -hmm. But granted, made me relax. It would be years later th that I realized that at the time that granddad saw me, that was the last time that he had seen my father at the age 16. Yes. So he must have had these emotions going through him. But for me, I was just excited to see him. And he made me relax and none of these, those emotions showed on his face. Yes. And he continued to ask me about pap smear when was the last time. Okay, have you had a pap smear? At that time I was very green. I mean, they said, what is a pap smear? So he, he really made me relax. And we were friends from that time till the day he died. Yes, yeah. that is such an unusual <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> conversation to be having yeah. on what is yeah. uh, very limited access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the moment minutes, the window is so small. Yeah, it's 30 minutes visit and boom. Yes. Before you know it, the time is over. But you mentioned your late father, mm -hmm. Tembe Kile. Mm -hmm. And what is one of the most painful things about what Madiba went through was the fact that he wasn't allowed, he wasn't allowed to leave Robben Island to bury his own son. Mm -hmm. Was this a kind of pain you only really got to understand when you were older? Yes, and uh, it also a pain that, you know, dad died when I was four years old and I never knew him. And the little snippets I have, it's from my aunts and I would, ask him, you know, what type of a, of a, of a person he was. And yeah. granddad never wanted to talk about dad at all. He would completely shut down, even if he was the happiest in it. And it was through when I, when I got letters from the foundation that I understood the depth of his pain, mm -hmm. because he explained to Chief Mangosutu Buteleze that he was given the news, he was, sit, he was in, in, in the docks and um, in the yard and the news were given to him around 2.30 p.m. And when he heard the news that dad had died, he says the veins that were flowing for the past 42 years in my veins seemed to have frozen to ice. Mm. And I stood for the longest time and I went to my cell. So it, was, it, it would be the pain that I would understand at a later stage, which is why right now I'm currently busy doing a documentary about my father. Because in all the pictures that you, saw, you see of him, he's stuck in child. People know him as a child, yes. and yet he grew to be an adult, yeah. got married, had me and my sister. So I'm resurrecting him from that child status, interviewing people that knew him, even people that went to him with him to Swaziland. So hopefully this year it will see it, it will be screened. Yes, mm. oh, and it will bring about so much healing. Yes, it will. It really will. Is that what then inspired the formation of your foundation, the Tembekile Madiba Foundation? You know, because when you I focus on the yes, similar themes yeah. that Madiba cared about. Well, when I started the foundation, it was born out of, you know, when you hit a certain age in your life, when you're just thinking, what is my purpose? You know, and it was in my mid 40s that it hit me. And at that time, I had just finished a project and I was touting around what it is that I must do. Mm -hmm. Bam, Grandes gets ill, 2011. And mm -hmm. that's when I decided to take a sabbatical to be by his bedside because of being me being a nurse. I knew his time was limited. Yeah. It was during this time that I said, look, the Nurse Mandela Foundation, now the center of memory, let me continue the work in the rural areas, in, in the space of education. And we still do education health and youth development. Mm -hmm. Education-wise, we're talking to the fourth industrial revolution in terms of computer labs, science laboratories, libraries, and sports facilities. Health-wise, we're dealing with the sanitary way. And on the youth development, we deal with different programs. One of them, which is the agricultural entrepreneurship program, where we take unemployed youth and train them agricultural practices, and then they get certification afterwards. They either do their own co-ops mm -hmm. or they mm -hmm. get employed they get absorbed in the in the in the industry i commend you for picking up this baton 
not only making your own mark, but mm. carrying on the legacy that Madiba has started. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's, it's a tall order. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, can, sure. Yeah. Well, still to come on Real Talk, we take a look at the three pillars that Indilega Mandela focuses on through the Tembekile Mandela Foundation, education, health, and youth unemployment. Be sure to come back. Welcome back to Real Talk on this Nelson Mandela Day, where we're celebrating the centenary event. Well, I'm in the company of one of Madiba's grandchildren, Ndileka Mandela. And judging by the inroads that she's already made over the years through her own foundation, the Tembekile Mandela Foundation, she is intent on keeping the legacies of her granddad and her dad alive with, while building her own. So, Ndileka, we, we had touched on the formation of this foundation and how these principles and values are so important to you. But speak to me about those principles when they first became so clear to you that Madiba embodied. Well, you know, throughout the years, I mean, throughout the time that I've known him, he had always revered education in all the letters, all the grandchildren that he read, he would ask about school. It's important to get educated. You must, you must, what grades, you when I turned 16, it was what grades did you have? What subjects are you doing? So education has always been important to him. Yeah. But when he got a release, it was uh, through observing him over the years, it, it is his simplicity. Granted, was a most simple person and his humility in, he was this revered person and yet he remained simple and humble at heart. And it's one of the things that are really heartwarming. That's one of the principles that I took from him, this, mm -hmm. this simplicity and embracing people from all walks of life, not discriminating whether they were a queen, a king, or a street sweeper. Right. To him, people are human beings, which is why he said that people belong to one race, the race of humankind. And of course, his love for children. Yes, his love, oh, <laughs> his love for, I mean, I think it is, that's one of the things he missed the most, you know, the laughter of children, yes. I mean, I attended a book launch recently of, a, I remember Nelson Mandela, and one, everybody talks about, especially because this book has been written by his bodyguards, people that worked with him, hmm. and they said they, they would be driving and granted would stop the car if he saw a child pass the road because his love for children was just immense. Oh, I wonder if these yeah. children recall <laughs> such occasions, you know, that they were once young and got yeah. the attention yeah. of this iconic mm -hmm. man. So when you were, when you took the sabbatical and you were at his bedside um, to not only spend quality time, but I'm sure to also just gain these nuggets of information and knowledge from him and this idea crystallized mm -hmm. in your mind, what were the exchanges? I know he was transitioning his very precious time yeah. ultimately, but did you have thoughts on your, your intentions? Yes, I, I told him that this is what I want to do and he gave it his blessing and he would talk you know, granted at that time, during 2011 to 2013, he was not so much in a talkative mood. I mm -hmm. mean, he would sit and read his paper and I would read my book and from time to time he'd extend his hand and we'd touch. And mm -hmm. uh, mainly when we saw something on the, on the TV, then he would then comment on, 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 on that. But it was through the conversation that we would have a table in, at, in the Eastern Cape because one of the conversation that he would say is that it is important for us to connect with our people, which mm -hmm. is why he had built the house in Kuno. He would tell us about, you know, that there was a neighbor that came to talk about the chicken that somebody stole and would laugh and find it very funny. Yeah. But at the essence of that, it was that it is good to go back home from where we came from to pour back. Mm and improve where you come from. So that's, that's one of the things, that's why it is important for me to go to the rural areas because I also grew up in the rural areas. I know how it is to walk for distances yeah. to go to school and not having these amenities. And one of the reasons we are leveraging on the fourth industrial revolution is that there are gifted children in the rural areas, mm -hmm. but because of a lack of resources, those children slip through the cracks. Let mm -hmm. us bridge the divide in, in, in the rural areas and capacitate the school so that those children have a chance. And I want to talk about pride of the rural girl, yes. but picturing you in my mind's eye, spending time with him uh, in his transitioning, I imagine even the silences were quite precious. They were, they were, they were. You know, at the time when I, to I told you earlier that, you know, there was a time that I battled with the, with, with, with 
this sharing him with everybody. Mm. It was through therapy that I got, I had to wrap it around my head because I would tell my therapist, but when I go and see him, he doesn't talk. He reads his paper and he's, she said to me, what makes you think that communication is about talking? Yes. Because sometimes communication is about sharing energy and space with the person. And that's how then I valued those three years that I spent with him. Because even though they were silent, that energy and space mm -hmm. that I shared with him and seeing how he treated his medical team was very dear to me. Absolutely. So let's go to this yes. focus, yes. Pride of the, the Rural, rural girl. girl. Yeah, yeah. Pride of the Rural Girl is a program where we raise funds to give sanitary wear to the r girls in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Because on average, each girl loses 50 days of schooling per year. And if you compound that over five years, that's a whole year of schooling, mm. which impacts on their performance at metric. That's why our cycle runs for five years. We give the, the sanitary from grade eight to 12, and that lessens their absenteeism days. But over and above that, we do uh, uh, talks in terms of life skills, in terms of STDs, uh, teenage pregnancies, drug abuse, and also we pair them with girls because what we found with boys, yeah. what we found is that there's a great di uh, divide, there's a vacuum where the boys are not nurtured because you have a take a girl learner to school, mm -hmm. then I have the pride of the rural girl. Whenever we go for the pet drops, you know, the boys will ask, what have you, what have you brought us? Yes. So yes. now we are stuck talking to other partners to say, okay, let us pay it with deodorant and stuff that we'll bring because also boys go through so personal, yes, care, yes, personal, personal care, care products that yes, they all go without. The, yes, uh -huh. and they, they also having these body changes. So let us accommodate them as much as we accommodate girls and we give them talks on how to 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 treat girls because some because some of the girls they get ridiculed if they bleed through their dresses mm -hmm. which is why we embarked on this program. Mm -hmm. Now you're also quite cautious mm -hmm. and warn against this being about hype. Mm -hmm. A day like yeah. Mandela Day yeah. being strictly about hype. What are your concerns? Well, my concerns are that you know it has got to be sustainable. Yes. As Silo said, you know it has to be being a Mandela day every day because yes, it's well and good to go and paint a school, what then? Mm. What then after painting that school? Mm. Mm. So it has got to be sustainable program that you can be able to measure their, their success over the number of years. For if, yes, people can embark on something, but be able to measure it over the years. The impact that it's the, had. The impact that it's had. It's well and good to paint a school, mm -hmm. but what then after the school? How is about starting a vegetable garden at that school and see how it then, you know, feeds the people in the area. Start something like that. Yes. Wow. Well, I hope that uh, you continue with your successful foundation because you are making an impact, especially Thank where you. we need it most. This Thank divide you. between yeah. the urban areas, the rural centers, it just continues to grow. And the inequality yeah. in our country as well is a source of concern. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing some of your most intimate memories with us today. Thank you so much, Azania. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Dileka Mandela for joining us this evening. If there was one thing that Madiba always prioritized during and after the struggle, it was ensuring that all South African children grow up being educated with access to health care and free from the shackles of poverty. After the break, we welcome the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund and the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital to find out how they're keeping Madiba's dream alive. It was back in 1995 when the late Nelson Mandela made a grand gesture by donating a third of his salary throughout his term in office to launch the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. No surprises given how he was driven by his love for children and a desire to end their suffering. Well, this desire lives on till today and we welcome the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund and Hospital, Smongilem Kabela, accompanied by a member of the Ifeng Bacha Youth Initiative Fund. Khudiso Mukunyani. Good afternoon and thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's such a wonderful Fantastic day of here. celebration. Yeah, no, it's good to be here. Yes. So, Nam Kabila, let me start with you because you have made a tremendous, extraordinary call. 
you have called on a hundred companies, South African yes. companies, to donate a hundred million rand yes. for the hundred celebration of Madiba's birth. It's extraordinary. It would be a wonderful achievement if it was if it became a reality. What would this money be used for? You see, we. we we started the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. This was his, was his final wish. Mm -hmm. It was about our children. It was about giving them a chance. And if 100 companies in this country were to put away 100 million as an endowment yeah, yeah. to ensure that we safeguard that institution. You see, when Mr. Nelson Mandela started the Children's Fund in 1995, it's very important that he said we must build our institutions that are caring and loving and they must be elegant. Mm. And I think the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, we've expressed the elegance of the institutions and the care and the love. We worry about the future. Yes. And if we worry about the future, the way, one way to deal with that worry is to turn it into a challenge. And we've put the challenge out there so that South African corporates, one million mm -hmm. per corporate, 100 corporates, would allow us to put aside a hundred million that would ensure the hospital is sustainable and a challenge to other people to save and to ensure that our children will be will, will be okay. The yes. children's hospital, as as we will recall, is the second hospital yeah. in South Africa, children's hospital in South Africa. It's taken us too long. It's mm. taken us all of sixty years to build another children's hospital because we have the Red Cross yeah. in Cape Town. We therefore have, as this gener as the people who are here today, my generation handing over to the younger generation, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that what we hand over is not a problem necessarily, but it's something that is institutionally strong and it, it, it can you know, stand the test of time. And I think it's a challenge also to say South Africa, if we are to rebuild ourselves, yes. We have to think long term. We absolutely have to. Absolutely. And the hospital just celebrated a year since it's opened its doors. A year since we admitted our first patient. Beautiful. Beautiful. We are and, so and we excited. need to be able to receive more children in need. We need to, but as they come in and the, the doctors are in now, the nurses are in, they're all excited, they're all enthusiastic. But the fact that we go to an ICU unit, and it, it hurts me already that we've had to turn children away because we have don't have enough space, the beds are full. Yes. But that just tells you the level of the need mm -hmm. for this hospital. But of course, it has already alleviated this pressure that exists in our you know, public hospitals, the pressure at Barra. And the pressure, in many instances, about s small things more than big things. Yeah. And I say small things, and I, I mean a heart that needs to be fixed. You fix that heart, he goes on to be a rugby player. You know? So we're looking forward to a bigger future a capacity that for South Africa to take care of its children. Remember, we're a young continent. Yeah. The majority of our population is under the age of 25. Mm, mm, and it's a state-of-the-art facility. But, Khuri, so let me come to you, because as a young person, you sit on the board of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. So you are tasked somewhat with also carrying on this legacy. But how do you respond then to an older generation that says today's young people just don't have the priorities in the right place? Yeah, so um, for me, it was an honor, actually, to be asked to sit on the board because I always, you know, saw them as the older people, um, the people that were grooming us. So I joined the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund uh, through Ifeng Bacha, yeah. so when Ifeng Bacha was launched in 2003. And at that stage, they told us that, you know, they see us as the leaders of today, not of tomorrow, of today, and that we need to be responsible today. So being at the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, they've never made us feel like we are a hopeless mm -hmm. nation or a hopeless youth. Mambongi and her staff, they always saw the potential in us and they helped us to harness whatever skills we had, whatever potential we had. So even for me, uh, being part of Ifeng Bacha and the North Mandela Children's Fund, I mean, it helped me to get a scholarship to go study actuarial science at Wits University. And even during that time, it was really tough. Uh, I mean, actuarial science requires you to be really good in maths, mm -hmm. in metric, mm -hmm. to get an A. And even after that, there are board exams that you need to write, and you are away from home. So I'm from Mabupani. So, so it was, yeah, yeah, it was really um, a family away from home. So, mm -hmm. you know, having encouragement from people who didn't necessarily give birth to you, 
but they give you the warmth, the heart, and right. also being part of the North Mandela's life and him, you know, giving you time out of his busy schedule. I remember at one point uh, on TV, he said, don't call me, I'll call you. You know, when he was when stopping you retired, his yeah. Yeah, public <laughs> appearances. But then for us, we always got to see him even oh. after that. Yeah, so it made me feel special, uh, important that, you know, he cares about me. I and so the green monster yeah. in me, of envy. <laughs> <laughs> Never got to meet the man. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so envious of you. Yeah, um, so I think that's why. So for me, um, when other people say, the future, you know, or the youth of today are lost. Yeah. I mean, I just think, okay, that's your view, and I don't have to absorb you that. Just that. Yeah, that's and fantastic. I mean, but Mom Kabila, you also feel that there should be a Nelson Mandela in every generation. How do we ensure I that? I only feel it. I know the race. Yes, because they, I've seen the Mandelas of tomorrow, mm. and they came to the to the organization when they. How old were you? Fifteen. We were fifteen years old, and we didn't see a future we saw a leader mm. and we gave them work and they've been working when we talk about our volunteers these have been our volunteers every event we have we call them hey come in you know there's an event coming up you're going to be you know receiving guests they've got work to do but more importantly they also do work in their communities we will be celebrating as part of the centenary yes. a hundred young people who are excelling in this country and when i say young don't go far to 35 i'm talking about Kids who are 30 and below, some of them are 18, 20, yes. 21. Whatever they are doing, they are excelling. They've written books. We've got an eight-year-old who's written, who already has written two books. Two books. Mm -hmm. Who's written two books. Lady, yes. We've got an amazing musicians. We've got children who, are own, who own businesses, mm. and they run their own fashion businesses. Out of the Fengbachi group, we already have someone who owns their event company. And from the way, when they were young, we gave them cameras at that time, well, you know, cell phones yes, didn't have yes. sophisticated cameras. So we gave them cameras. And they went around shooting whatever they wanted to shoot. And we respected Incredibly what powerful. they produced. Because yes. if we don't respect what children produce, the pe they are pe it's, it's not inferior. It's their perspective of the world. And once you gain that perspective, you gain something. Hmm. So it's, I think, and Mandela understood this. He, he didn't only love children. He knew that our survival depended on how we appreciate the value that sits with children. You need to always remember that. And that's why you had the Youth Summit, right? You hosted a Youth Summit. What was the objective? So, I mean, um, with the Youth Summit, what we realized is that, you know, uh, like you mentioned, some people don't really believe in the youth of today. And sometimes, uh, as young people, we start to believe what other people are saying as well. So what we decided as Effect Bacha was that we needed to actually touch the whole country and touch young people and hear their voices and have discussions with them. So we went throughout the country mm -hmm. um, as a build up to our um, national summit uh, to different provinces. Mm -hmm. And we spoke to young people to find out what are the burning issues? You know, what are you facing and what do you want to do about it? So at the National Youth Summit, Summit, what we discussed was issues around social justice, uh, youth entrepreneurship, you know, um, a Mandela in our generation, you know, seeing ourselves as the future and the current leaders of South Africa and the world at large. And it's been amazing to talk to young people to see what everyone else is doing and, you know, yeah. amazing things. I mean, we also have this young 10-year-old girl. Um, I mean, she is amazing as well. You know, you can see, like, <laughs> she has a super high IQ. And when you first talk to her, she's so shy and, you know, um, she doesn't know how to interact with people because of her high IQ. But then when you start actually making her feel comfortable mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, making her you know, connect with other young kids. That's then she amazing. starts blooming the out. Tomorrow. And yeah. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on what Ifeng Bacha yes. uh, produces in coming years. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this auspicious occasion, a day that fills all of us with pride. Thank that you. was Mama Sbongilem Kabela and Hudiso Mokonyani.
As we've come to discover, there have been a number of events to arise from the Nelson Mandela Centenary celebrations. Earlier this year, the Tourism Department launched an app showcasing 100 destinations aligned with the struggle icon. We also saw how the South African Reserve Bank launched a set of commemorative banknotes in Madiba's honor. We now turn our focus to fashion, where clothing brand Kisua and the Nelson Mandela Foundation have teamed up to relaunch the 46664 clothing range. He has dressed the likes of Beyonce, Estelle, and author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, to name just a few. So here to talk more about the 46664 collection, please welcome the founder of Kisua, Sam Nensa. Hello, Sam. Hey, Zonia. I see that you're already wearing the merch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is Thank just you. stunning. The launch happened in um, late June. Yes. It we... must have been an honor. Yeah, absolutely. It's been uh, actually been quite some time in the works but it's uh, such a pleasure to have the opportunity to revive something that is so iconic and so important to um, our psyche mm -hmm. and the, the struggle for liberation in South Africa. Yes and I'm sure for you from the get-go this was an obvious yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll be part I, of I, it. Was, uh, I was cornered uh, the conversation start actually started four years ago. Yeah. You know how do we bring this back um, and and how do we make it something that speaks to young people. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done in this new 46664 collection. We've given the brand a, a new, new soul. Um, it speaks to the struggle, yeah. but it also looks forward and challenges young people to be socially active and socially conscious today. Mm -hmm. um, and to say something through what they wear. Yeah. You know, fashion is a very powerful tool. It is. You can communicate without actually uttering a word. No, and I love that you say that, and it's a, a learning that no doubt you've had through your journey of building Kisua, because when different people had an opportunity to wear the clothes and be filled with pride, that the, the story that comes with it is one of supporting black business across the continent. And then to have someone like Beyonce or even Estelle uh, boldly wear your clothes, it must be incredibly rewarding that you took this risk with this model and to create this brand. Absolutely, I mean, it's very easy for um, us to import products, they're cheaper, to import from Asia and other parts of the world. But we made a conscious decision as a brand yeah. that we were going to tell African stories and we were going to use as much as possible, as close to 100% as possible, an African supply chain mm. and source product from different parts of Africa and produce in Africa and sell in Africa and sell across the world. And we're applying a similar philosophy to 46664. Um, practically everything in the 46664 collection is made locally. Wow. Um, and so we are also, you know, empowering young people who are part of the, uh, the production uh, and, uh, and also using it as an opportunity to, uh, to raise funds for the fantastic work that is being done mm -hmm. uh, at the Children's Hospital. And, uh, and the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Ah, so all, there is a link, there's a connection. But let's talk about how Madiba has been iconized because we've seen how other leaders across the world have achieved successful iconization. You think of Che Guevara, you think of Steve Biko. So to you, what sort of images come to mind that iconize Madiba? Because even the one that you're wearing now is a classic image of, of Madiba after he was released from prison with the black power fist in the air. So. I think that this silhouette of Madiba, which I absolutely love, it's an iconic moment in history. Yes. I think it's going to be around for the next 100 years. Our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will know this image. They might not quite remember all the details, but they'll know that it was important. Mm -hmm. And this man did something, and I owe this man something. And I, by wearing this, I'm demonstrating that I'm buying into something really important. Yes. So. How do you make sure that this continues beyond this initial range? As you said, it is targeted at young people. It's T-shirts, it's sweaters, it's berets and caps for both genders, you know, and with different images, of course, and different statements. But how do we make sure that 46664 has longevity? So the way to do that is to keep innovating with the clothes right. and keep it fresh, keep it exciting, uh, keep coming up with new ranges. So what you've seen so far it's just the first installment. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to be bringing out more installments that celebrate um, 
the young Madiba. You know, the, the focus is very much on, a lot of young people remember Madiba as the sweet old man mm. who came He's out of jail, father. yes, and he forgave everybody, right? There's so much about Madiba that you'd be surprised young people don't know. Mm. Young people, don't, a lot of young people I've met don't know that he was the founder of Mkonto Wei Sizwe. Mm -hmm the military wing of the ANC, that he, he was a rebel rouser. He was so frustrated at the killing of black people that he founded a parliamentary wing and he traveled across Africa, yeah. gaining support from our African brothers for the struggle in South Africa, setting up training camps, mm -hmm. raising funding for the struggle in, in South Africa. So there's so much that young people can engage with. Absolutely. Uh, including the fact that the struggle is not over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well. I trust that uh, you've commemorated in a style you would have wanted to. But thank you for being here, Sam. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much to all of my guests today who, in their own way, are all committed to keeping the memory and legacy of Nelson Kholihlatha Mandela alive. But hey, it, don't just limit it to doing something good just today. Make every day a Mandela day. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. Isi Dingo is up next. Real Talk is proudly sponsored by Huawei P20 Pro and MTN.